Okay, everybody, welcome back to another video. Um, in my string of summer beers, I have kind of realized that it's been a very long time since I brewed a dark beer, so got me thinking, what kinds of dark summer beers are out there? After thinking a little bit, I came up with a list that included black lagers, such as Schwarz beers, um, dark saisons, black IPAs, as long as they're dry enough, and um, actually, Certain porters I have had in the past have been very refreshing, which I imagine would be pretty good in uh, the heat. So I'm going to attempt to brew one of those today. Uh, we are brewing a American style porter, I would say. It's gonna be experimental because I'm gonna be trying to shoot for a very smooth, but still somewhat dry mouthfeel. Uh, and it's also going to be experimental because I am going to be, <laughs> against most conventional wisdom, um, tweaking my water profile in certain ways. Ideally, this porter should be like light to medium bodied, easy to drink, uh, not overwhelming in terms of its flavor, not heavy and definitely not sweet. We don't want a sweet, heavy beer for the summer, obviously, because those kind of are hard to drink. As an American style porter, even though I'm still using largely majority British ingredients, I'm gonna be using American USO5 yeast, and I'm also gonna be using a lot of hops. This is gonna be about 44 or 45 IBUs uh, in terms of overall bitterness. So it's gonna be a noticeably hoppier, more, you know, I, I would say balanced flavor than your typical malt forward English porter. Uh, it's also going to hopefully be a little less fruity than your typical English porter. I'm using midnight wheat instead of uh, chocolate malt in the porter in this recipe in an attempt to cut down on the amount of bitterness. Uh, midnight wheat is a debittered black malt that should provide a lot of good flavor and character uh, that you would get with a dark beer without all of the roast and acridness. Uh, should also significantly darken the beer, which is really what we want. So we're going to add nine pounds of marisotter as a base malt. Should be nice and bready, uh, full flavored English base malt there. Um, to that, we're gonna add a pound and a half of Munich and one pound of Crystal 40. A little bit of Crystal in there is gonna add just a tiny bump, I think, to the sweetness. Uh, like I said, I don't want it to be overly sweet, but it is, you know, 44 IBUs, so we do wanna kinda carefully play that balance um, in terms of maltiness versus hoppiness. Uh, and I think that should hopefully work out pretty well. All right, to that, we are adding one pound of Midnight Wheat, so that's that debittered black malt for color. We're gonna add three quarters of a pound of brown malt, which is a specialty porter malt. To that, we're adding half a pound of flaked barley, which is hopefully going to help round out the mouthfeel and add to smoothness. And uh, then one quarter pound of black patent malt. That's just a touch of roast and a lot of nice dark black, like jet black color. In my mash, I think I'm gonna probably end up adding these dark malts at the very end. So like the last 15 minutes of the mash. Uh, and that is a trick that I used for my black IPA uh, when I made that, and it really cut down on the acridness and the acidity that cut, that those black malts add. So I think we're going to do that, um, but like I said, I'm playing with my, I'm experimenting with my brewing water, so I might have to keep tabs on the pH. We might have to add those black malts in earlier, so we'll see. Uh, for hops, I am adding one ounce of Northern Brewer at 60 minutes to bitter. And then we're gonna wait until 15 minutes are left in the boil, and then we'll add an ounce each of East Kent Goldings and Northern Brewer. And then at zero minutes, we're gonna do the same thing, add another ounce each of East Kent Goldings and Northern Brewer. Uh, the two of those hops together make a really interesting kind of sort of woody note uh, when they're added in the late boil. And um, add to that a good, solid, clean, um, hopefully, unobtrusive uh, bitterness from Northern Brewer at uh, 60 minutes, and I think we might have a winning combo here. Uh, for yeast, I'm using US05 yet again, um, because it is a great freaking yeast, and that's really all there is to say about it. Now water, this is where it gets interesting. So if this is one of the first times that you're watching one of my videos, uh, welcome first of all, but also know that I'm not using reverse osmosis water. I am building off of an existing water profile for my city, which is uh, high in chloride and high in sodium, uh, which are two interesting ions to have large counts of, and the rest of everything is rather low. Uh, so I have to make some awkward adjustments to my water profile sometimes, and I do have trouble getting the proper water profile for dark beers sometimes. 
In this situation, like pretty much all situations, I would definitely encourage you to go do your own research, figure out how to build your own water profile for whatever water you are working with. Um, but dark beers require a high residual alkalinity. What that means is we want to have a high amount of basically bicarbonate left over in the water. This residual alkalinity is going to do a lot of things for the beer, but mostly it's going to help keep the pH in check. And the pH of the beer and dark beer is typically going to go towards the acidic side if you're not careful. So adding the alkalinity means that it raises the pH slightly, which is going to keep it in balance. If your pH goes out of whack, your beer is going to taste flat and one-dimensional, especially if it's uh, going towards the acidic side, it's also going to taste a little tart. Uh, so not really something you're looking for in a porter. Uh, so what I have done <laughs> in my water profile here is added a huge amount of chalk, which is again another thing that is very much against conventional homebrewing wisdom. Chalk does not dissolve in water. It basically requires the water to be carbonated uh, in order to, long story short, break down the calcium and carbonate ions because those bonds are too strong to be broken by water itself. I don't really have like a soda stream or anything like that to carbonate my own water in just a smaller container. I did try dissolving some chalk in some seltzer water earlier and it wasn't really successful. Um, that still has some work to be done, but I got a brew today. So um, what we're gonna do is a different approach, which is kind of the conventional approach of acknowledging that yes, chalk does not dissolve in water. However, some of its carbonate ions will get broken down uh, and it will contribute about on average half of the alkalinity that you would otherwise expect it to if it had completely dissolved. So with that being said, I am using 12 grams of chalk, which is probably gonna really only realistically add the effectiveness of about six grams of chalk. So my water profile as it stands is 136 parts per million of calcium, 19 parts per million of magnesium, 78 parts per million of sodium, 62 parts per million of sulfate, 123 parts per million of chloride, and 243 parts per million of carbonate. And I'm adding six grams of Epsom, two grams of calcium chloride, two grams of baking soda, and 12 grams of chalk to the water uh, in order to hopefully land at that water profile. Um, <laughs> so we'll see if that works. I'm mashing at 151 degrees for 60 minutes and uh, depending on how the pH goes, like I said, I will probably be adding the uh, at least the black patent brown malts and uh, midnight wheat at about the 15 minute mark in the mash uh, in order to uh, minimize the amount of acrid flavor that could come out. Both my mash and sparge water were treated with uh, that water profile as well as half a Camden tablet to get rid of any chloramine or chlorine flavors. And um, also we are all up to temp. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk over there and we will dough it. All right, so I use this recirculation system to help maintain a consistent temperature in the mash. Um, just kind of helps out with precision and stuff. It's not necessary to make beers like this at all. Uh, you can do fine with a standard igloo cooler setup. You will make great beer. Um, so don't worry about having that sort of setup. Just aim for the mash temperature. Uh, so we are ready to dough in. All right, so I'm gonna let this get settled and then um, I am gonna off camera take a pH reading just to make sure uh, things are going the way they should be. Um, but anyway, we're gonna come back in a little while and we'll add our roasted malts towards the very end of the mash and we'll let those sit in there for about 15 minutes. So it turns out that uh, 45 minutes is just about enough time to get outside for a run, which is why I am hot, sweaty, and disgusting right now. So anyway, we have 15 minutes left in the mash, so it's time to go ahead and add our dark malts.
it looks like everything went off according to plan. So now we're gonna go ahead and start collecting the wort. So uh, what we're gonna do is drain out from the mash tun into this kettle here. So we'll get our first runnings and then whatever we have left, we'll make up with the sparge water that I have over here, which is getting heated up to about 170 degrees. We'll sparge, we'll collect our second runnings and top off this kettle and then we'll pump it all back into the main uh, kettle here once I remove all the uh, grain and the bag and stuff like that and then we'll get ready for the boil. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so here's the pre-boil gravity sample. Um, and it is about 10.8 bricks, which translates to a gravity of about 1042. So we're about three points short of our expected 1045, uh, but that's really not bad. So uh, we're in a good place. We've just hit our boil, uh, which means it is time to add our bittering hop addition, the uh, one ounce of Northern Brewer pellets. So those are gonna go in right now. Okay, so uh, let this sit here for 45 minutes and then we'll come back. Okay, so we're 15 minutes from the end of the boil, which means it's time to add our one ounce each of Northern Brewer and East Kent Goldings. As well as uh, some yeast nutrient here and a Whirlflock tablet. The other thing that's gonna happen around this period of time involves whatever chilling system you have. In my case, I have a plate chiller here. Uh, you might have an immersion chiller, counterflow chiller, something like that. Um, regardless of what you have, it really helps to take uh, about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the boil and recirculate the boiling wort through the chiller and back into the kettle. Uh, what that's gonna do is help sanitize the inside of the chiller and make sure that you killed off any sort of bacteria, germs, whatever might be in there. Um, assuming, of course, that the inside of the chiller is already clean. It's kind of bad if you have like chunks of mold in there because you didn't clean it out after your last brew because that will destroy your beer. So don't do that. We've now hit the end of the boil. So I'm gonna go ahead and add our zero minute hop addition. One more ounce each of uh, East Kent Goldings and Northern Brewer. In they go. Now we're gonna also kill all the heat sources. Okay, so while it's chilling down, um, I am going to quickly talk about fermentation. Uh, fermentation should be very simple. Um, uh, it is a standard ale fermentation where you typically ferment from 65 degrees to 68 degrees Fahrenheit for about two weeks. Uh, the USO5 that I'm using loves to do that temperature range, uh, so uh, it shouldn't be a big deal. I'm in the process right now of rehydrating my USO5 as well. Um, I like to rehydrate my dry yeast before I add it because it helps wake up the yeast and vitalize it a little bit. I'm gonna try and ferment this, I think, on the cooler end of the spectrum around 65 degrees. Um, I, there is conflicting reports out there about this, but in my experience, I've found USO5 to be very fruity um, in 68 to 72 degrees. Uh, so I like to kind of ferment it on the lower end of the spectrum just to control those fruity esters. I don't really want too much fruitiness in this beer. I really do just kind of want it to be a clean, not noticeable yeast profile. So once this is cooled down to about 65 degrees, we'll go ahead and pitch and uh, aerate and ferment as usual. So we're just about done chilling now. So I'm gonna go ahead and start transferring from uh, the recirc back into the fermenter here. So basically one of the ways that uh, you can ensure you have enough oxygen in the wort and it's sufficiently aerated for good yeast health is to splash it into the fermenter uh, from a decent height up. Uh, so that's what I typically do. It has worked very well for me in the past and uh, typically you'll get several inches worth of foam uh, on top of the wort. Uh, so everything's transferred and aerated fully. So we're gonna go ahead and pitch our yeast. So we'll grab a quick original gravity sample and I will catch you in a few weeks. 
All right, so this is the original gravity sample. Uh, looks like it's about 13 and a half bricks, uh, which is actually kind of low. Uh, that translates to about 1053. We were actually targeting 1060. Um, but you know what? I'm actually kind of okay with this because 1060 means we could get down to over 6% ABV. Um, and I'm actually kind of hoping to keep this on the lower end. So maybe this is actually a good thing. I don't know. We'll see. We'll ferment it out and see what happens. Final gravity for the porter is in and uh, it's looking like it's about 1016, uh, which is a bit on the high side, but nothing too astronomical. So it's, uh, it's pretty good fermentation. It did take a while to reach this final gravity, but that's okay. All right, so this beer was probably not my finest. Uh, I'm just gonna put that out here right now. Uh, but we'll talk about why when I actually sit down and break it down. Uh, but in the meantime, fermentation went relatively well, um, but it took a very long time to reach a final gravity that I was actually convinced was the final gravity. Uh, this fermentation was rather sluggish and uh, took a pretty long time to get down to 1016, which is still kind of higher than I was expecting for a final gravity, uh, but that is okay. Uh, there has been a pretty consistent theme within most of my dark beers, specifically the ones that have roasted malts in them, uh, to finish higher than predicted uh, by Beersmith. So I have to look into that a little bit more, but I'm really starting to think it might be coming down to the point where I need to be a lot more specific with how I work in the mash uh, and specifically in the water chemistry uh, to ensure that I actually have proper pH in that mash. And I think it really is a little bit more out of whack than I thought. At some point, I think my brewing needs a dedicated pH meter. Um, they are expensive and I've really kind of held off on buying one for a long time, but I really just need to make sure that my mash pH is in check for these dark beers. Otherwise, they're all gonna keep coming out, not tasting the way I want them to. Uh, fermentation was kind of sluggish, like I said, you know, I didn't, I don't think I had a great mash. And also I have been away from home for several weeks and I didn't get a chance to really put this in a keg or somewhere else. Uh, so it was stuck in the plastic fermenter for like three weeks, which is a little bit longer than it really should be sitting in an oxygen permeable fermenter. So definitely a lot of things uh, happened during this brew that really could have been avoided and probably would have significantly improved this beer. It's definitely drinkable um, and I think the recipe holds water, but uh, it's just not my favorite beer uh, that I've made in a while. All right, so it's called Will Beer for Work and it comes in at 4.9% ABV and 44 IBUs. Okay, so for appearance of the beer, it's pretty dark. Um, it looks black because of the sunlight, but uh, it really is actually quite a dark shade of brown, um, but not exactly black. Not quite like a, a dark uh, stout would be, for example. It pours with a very tight tan head full of very small bubbles. And it does also have a pretty significant head retention, which is good. Uh, that is 100% due to roasted malts and caramel malts. All right, so now we'll go in for aroma. So right off the bat, I get a uh, kind of a sharp aroma of a little bit of roast. Um, it's a little bit more sharp than I'm looking for in a porter, but I also get a bit of a, a chocolate note as well. And um, yeah, nothing fruity. Uh, it's actually pretty clean in terms of yeast, which is good. Uh, and no real hop aroma. Maybe a little bit of earthiness if I'm really looking for it. But uh, yeah, pretty much just uh, just a straight up uh, kind of chocolate coffee roast type thing. So now we'll go in for mouthfeel. So it's actually got a pretty light body and that is actually what I was targeting in the style. Um, so it has relatively high drinkability. It's not over carbonated. It's actually, despite being light bodied um, and easy to drink, it is actually kind of smooth um, on the mouthfeel. It goes down very easily and it's also kind of like a pleasant uh, sensory experience in terms of uh, how it feels. Yep, so now we'll move on to flavor. So the flavor of this one is interesting. Um, now, you know, first off, right off the bat, not exactly what I was going for. It has a little too much of a uh, acidic bite to it. So. One of the reasons why my beer had a sluggish fermentation uh, is because of that mash pH. I don't think I had as efficient of a mash as I typically do. Um, 
Also having a mash pH that's slightly off uh, results in a beer that is um, not as interesting to drink. And if it's on the low side, it's gonna be a little more acidic. And I think that is what happened here. We still did not get the alkalinity in the wort up to the level that I needed to, uh, despite throwing all that chalk in. Uh, so we were left with a slightly more acidic beer than we should have had. So that's why you're gonna get a little bit of a bite, a little bit of tartness on it. Um, but other than that, the, uh, the roast flavor is, is there, um, and it's gentle, but it's still kind of there in a way that I don't quite like to a great degree. Uh, not a huge fan of it. This, it feels more to me like an Irish stout than a porter. Um, that being said, I think it tastes better than my Irish stout did. So when I made my Irish stout, I added acid malt to it to try and replicate the Guinness bite. Um, but it ended up being an acidic beer already without the acid malt, so it just went way out of whack, and it was a very sharp tasting beer. This doesn't have as much sharpness to it, but for a porter, especially a summer drinking porter, I'm really looking for almost no bite. Um, I'm looking for something that's smooth and flavorful and easy to drink, and also having some multi-dimensional flavor as well. Uh, one of the other problems with not having a mash pH in check is that you're, uh, you're kind of left with a little bit of a one-dimensional flavor, which I think is the case here, although that may age out. So let's see, we're also getting um, a kind of a, a dry roast coffee type thing. Um, and a little hint of chocolate, but uh, you get a lot of that, you get like a nice kind of, actually relatively satisfying uh, roasted barley note. So yes, the, there's a little bit more roast than I want, but the roast that is there is somewhat pleasing. Uh, with If you take the acid note out of the picture and you try to avoid that, um, it does end up being relatively pleasing. Kind of got that soft oatmeal stout kind of feel to it, I think, uh, if that makes any sense whatsoever. It's also got kind of a semi-dry bitterness as well. Um, the bitterness is intentional uh, because it is, you know, brewed in the American porter style. It's going to be a little bit more hoppy. Um, and I think those are actually coming through nicely uh, in terms of balancing out the, uh, the malt sweetness that would have been there. It's definitely not sweet. Uh, it's got kind of an earthy, slightly woody bitterness to it. I think, yeah, I'd say I'd definitely use Northern Brewer again. Uh, that definitely does pretty well in this style. There is one thing that is present in this beer that I rather wasn't, uh, is definitely signs of oxidation. Uh, it definitely is, it has a little bit of that cardboard papery note um, that you get when your beer sits out for a little too long uh, and becomes oxidized. Uh, in a dark beer, it's not as detrimental as it would be in a pale beer, or especially as in a hoppy beer. Um, so it's actually kind of okay in this. I would rather it wasn't there, so I had a little more full flavor, because uh, the combination of the mash pH being out of check and an oxidized beer results in a relatively uninteresting beer. Um, and that is what this is at the end of the day. I'm not very impressed with it. So at the end of the day, uh, the beer is drinkable. The beer is uh, definitely okay by my standards. Uh, definitely not my best work whatsoever. It could have been a lot better had I timed everything better uh, and known that I was gonna be away from home for you know three weeks. Uh, but otherwise, it would have been okay. Um, and the other thing I think that I've really learned through this process is that for any beer that I'm brewing that has a roasted malt portion, um, even if it's a dehusked one like that midnight wheat that I used. Uh, I really just need to start with RO water. I need to bite that bullet. I can't start with my city water because it is incredibly unfriendly to dark beers. Um, the main challenge I had in this process was getting my alkalinity high enough to the point that the uh, acid, uh, to the point that the pH drop um, that you get when you mash in with dark roasted malts was countered appropriately and that would keep my mash pH in check. I probably could use 5.2 stabilizer, but I've kind of tried to stay away from that stuff if I can. Uh, so I think I'm just gonna bite that bullet and use RO water and build my own profile from zero parts per million of everything. Uh, and I think that's probably gonna be the solution to my problems. Like I said, most of my dark beers have almost pretty much entirely come out one dimensional, 
and have finished with a very high final gravity. Uh, and they've all kind of been somewhat mediocre beers. Um, and the only exception to that process, I think, was the Russian Imperial Stout that I made uh, last year. And the only reason for that being so interesting is because I use so many ingredients. So, so far I've found that my water is pretty friendly towards most lagers uh, that don't use roasted malts. I have yet to do a Schwartz beer here, so um, we'll stay tuned for that. But uh, most lagers, most pale beers, most hoppy beers, it's generally pretty friendly towards that. But when it comes down to adding roasted malts into the mash, uh, it really does end up kind of becoming a pain. So yeah, moving forward, I'm just gonna start from a clean palette on that and um, we'll see how that goes, I think. What I would do differently besides changing the water chemistry significantly, um, probably would add a little bit more flaked barley and a little less roasted barley. I think I would keep the hopping regimen the same though. Uh, I do like the way that the hops turned out in this one. Uh, and I definitely would make sure, of course, that we're not being uh, heavily oxidized during the fermentation process. Other than that, the beer was okay. And uh, I'm just gonna give that a five out of 10. You know, um, I think that is a fair rating uh, given how much went wrong with it. But I will keep it on tap, and I think this one will probably age pretty gracefully, although it's you know, not going to really be my go-to. Uh, it's definitely not ruined. It's definitely not a beer that I'm dumping. So I guess with that in mind, it's really not that much of a failure. All right, so thanks for watching, guys. Uh, recipe for this beer is in the description down below if you want to check that out uh, for how I brewed it. And I highly, highly, highly recommend that you use your own water chemistry and build it from RO water, given my experience. Um, it probably would be beneficial to you to do that. If you like the video, just hit that like button for me real quick. Helps out uh, making my channel a little bit more relevant to YouTube and uh, getting my videos out there. And also, if you like to see this stuff on a regular basis, please subscribe. I will typically kick out grain of glass videos or other types of brewing related videos uh, roughly every two to three weeks. And uh, I also have an Instagram. It's at the apartment brewer on Instagram if you want to check out more frequent updates on the order of every couple days to see what I'm brewing in real time and what might be uh, making its way to the YouTube channel in a couple weeks. Also in the description box, you're going to find a uh, complete list of all of my home brewing equipment and links to Amazon where you can purchase it for yourself if you happen to be in the market for some brewing equipment. Uh, just be advised that if you do click on those links and buy something through Amazon, I do earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you and it does go right back into support of this channel, so I do appreciate it. So without further ado, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, finish off the rest of this beer and get back to brewing. I'm currently working on a New England IPA, so you guys will see that in a couple weeks. Till then, cheers guys.